everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Lamode. And today on Hot Lamode, we are going to be breaking down a bunch of collections from the men's fall 2021 season collection in Paris or the French ones at least. Honestly, I wanna say that throughout this entire video, I probably will be changing outfits and my hairstyle and how my facial hair looks because we're filming these videos as we go so that we're not like just doing one whole big chunk of video. It makes it easier for us to get it out in a timely manner. Yeah, but first up, let's get into this review of Louis Vuitton by Virgil Abloh. Louis Vuitton's menswear fall 2020 collection was the moment I realized that Virgil Abloh at LV had finally gotten his shit together. And for his fall 2021 collection, which we're gonna be talking about, I've realized that he's managed to keep his shit together. And for that, I'm very happy. The collection was about travel, which was evident by the silver airplane buttons on the first coat. Instead of a pocket square on the coat was a red piece of paper that read Louis Vuitton, maybe a reference to passports or plane tickets. The most interesting aspect of the first look was the mirror monogram suitcase, which we first saw on Marc Jacobs's Louis Vuitton runway for fall 2006 women's wear. Jacobs had collaborated with the Swiss artist Sylvie Fleury and created speedy and keep all bags in the reflective fabric. Virgil is known to reference heavily, so at this point it doesn't really upset me, it's just sort of expected. An asymmetrical suit jacket followed. It wasn't cut asymmetrically, but buttoned to create asymmetry. I don't really understand it. The tipped hat that the model wears with green bandana ties underneath feels like two Prince headgear staples combined. Both the hats to the side and the little bandanas as well. A black suit with fitted red puffer jacket is followed by a pinstripe vest, short sleeve shirt, and tie, which is paired with jeans and elbow length leather gloves. It's interesting to see gloves, but no masks. A brown pinstripe suit feels stiff, but I don't see that as necessarily a bad thing. Since the fall 2020 LV menswear collection, Virgil's tailoring has become top notch, and I think this is a nice example. An all black ensemble has a mid sleeve t shirt, shin length pleated skirt, which Virgil has done before, and black pants, but with degendering of clothing becoming more popular, looks like these make a lot of sense. The plaid tote bag is a quite complex bag and is even more complex in the context of Abloh's work. The plastic checkered bags are often associated with Hong Kong, but also associated with Ghana, where Abloh's parents are initially from. They are often called Ghana must go bags, which is based on a political disagreement between Ghana and Nigeria between the 1960s and the 1980s. Also, I don't think you're supposed to like call them Ghana must go bags because it's kind of derogatory. So I'm just using this for like a for example, for the context. This forced many Ghanaian immigrants in Nigeria to leave the country with people carrying their belongings in these bags. Now, Marc Jacobs during his spring 2007 collection for Louis Vuitton made more expensive versions of these bags and showed it on the runway. But to me, this is Virgil more so reclaiming the history of this bag rather than referencing Marc's work. But it's weird that they're all sort of pushed together and mashed together. A more spacious pinstripe suit emerges. It looks not wrinkled, but certainly not pressed either. And I wonder if that's like a testament to modern men and their lack of suiting, or at least their lack of care about suiting. The soft trunk bag makes an appearance and to my naked eye, the monogram motif reminds me of the funky multicolored carpet padding that lays underneath rugs. It kind of feels like a more low key take on marble, an expensive material with a more down to earth vibe. Coats and pleated skirts in what look like tartans, one resembling the Royal Stuart tartan, is an interesting choice. It's probably Virgil making reference to kilts. I mean, the pleated and the plaid, it just sort of uh, kilty. But neither really excite nor make new on the Scottish textiles. Another pinstripe look emerges with the vest having some sort of fabric flowers cascading down on one side, which we did see during the spring 2021 LV collection, albeit with stuffed animals instead. A black and red grid suit follows with a brown overcoat on top and red shirt and tie underneath. It's quite chic, you know, it's not too crazy, but it's nice enough. Now, a black and red military coat might seem like Virgil lifting from another great designer, Alexander McQueen, if you've seen the Dante collection. But in fact, I don't think that's true at all. Maybe I just fabricated that in my head. The coat is lined with military style braiding, but at the sleeves and the far edges of the torso, it actually creates the Japanese May inspired flowers. That is one of the four elements of the Louis Vuitton monogram. 
down. I see what you're doing, Virgil. It's very smart. You can watch our Louis Vuitton history video to learn more about the origins of the monograms, but this look in particular is quite brilliant. And the simple black suiting and deconstructed pleated cummerbund adds a little bit of depth. The Louis Vuitton monogram is heavy in this collection, but so far I don't see that as a bad thing. I don't think the Louis Vuitton monogram being heavy in any collection is necessarily a bad thing. A clear PVC monogram suit appears, and to me is probably inspired by Louis Vuitton's collaboration with Yayoi Kusama, which had a polka dot covered PVC trench coat. Here, Virgil smartly makes the style his own, and this is a piece I think will drive LV collectors and Virgil fans wild. A full tartan look emerges with coat, skirt, and hood, and I won't say it's miraculous, but it's certainly interesting to look at. A wool coat that drags on the floor behind the model is dramatic and feels like the height of luxury. A coat that only those who go from chauffeured car to chauffeured car could wear without ruining it you know, that's pretty luxurious. The coat appeared quite a bit in different forms from a white wool to blue denim to beige and green trench coats throughout the entirety of the collection. Not everything works though, as a white suit is manipulated to create some sort of waist, but just looks like it's gone through a sewing machine one too many times. And the embossed monogram pants with it that have the side zippers doesn't have the intended effect. I will say this keep all bag in a Louis Vuitton monogram that reads Louis Vuitton with an exclamation point at the end with the exclamation point actually holding another Louis Vuitton flower is fun and a nice way for Virgil to play on the brand's signature. A good Vuitton designer knows that the monogram is the bread and the butter of this brand. It's what makes the money. And while having a vision for the brand is great, Louis Vuitton makes up 50% of the profits for LV MH, its parent company. So remaking that monogram to be appealing to customers over and over and over and over again is literally vital to the job. A white shoulder button down short sleeve shirt feels like a Margiela reference. A granite motif suit is lovely and a green and black monogram parka is intriguing but not terribly appealing. A croc embossed jacket resembles salvage denim, but also croc skin, and I'm confused, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. While a green sweater has interweavings of green fur that create motifs, which is also fun. I have to say Virgil's knitwear prowess has grown considerably, and a green cardigan version in full fur is also quite illustrious. A green and purple plaid jacket and pleated skirt, again, might be a tie to Scottish tartan, but I also wonder if the Maasai's use of plaids might be a reference Virgil is tapping into. It seems like Africa as a whole is sort of capturing his attention here. Shuka cloth is believed to have originated after Scottish missionaries brought tartan to Kenya and Tanzania and the Maasai people. But since then, the Maasai have made the textile all of their own. Here, Virgil has taken neon green and darker purple, which gives the look more of a modern feel. A green and white leather motocross set appears that has a very 80s feel to it, between the motif and the brand name on it in that purple and neon pink, and the carpet padding motif jumps from bags to suits in the next look. We should probably discuss Virgil's cityscape coats. Are they gimmicky? Yes. Are they really any more gimmicky than Maria Grazia Curie's Dior in a Box? No. The first one seems to be the cityscape of Chicago, Virgil's hometown, and the second one is a take on Paris with Eiffel Towers and Notre Dame as a few notable landmarks. They're not good in the slightest, but I do think Virgil's fans will love them. More carpet padding styles come, one having a harness, now a Louis Vuitton classic in my eyes. They've definitely gotten less play as of late, but I think this stuffed version reminds me of safety jackets those on planes wear, but maybe I'm just looking too deeply into Virgil's Virgil's travel theme. The mirror monogram emerges again in bag form, but also hat and coat form. And it's most definitely a link to Mark's iconic mid 2000s monogram. Although Virgil has shown reflective leathers before during his fall 2019 LV show. Bathrobe coats seem to be in as the idea of formality and comfort blend during the pandemic and a puffer skirt and coat style emerge in yellow, green, and purple is filled with the monogram, which might be the first time Tartan has ever gotten the LV tune-up. I think it's definitely been on the runway, but I don't know if it's ever had the monogram on it. A full fur coat and hat reminds me of photos that fashion historian Shelby Ivy Christie found from Muhammad Ali's fight in New York against Oscar Bonavena. The subjects were documented in Life magazine and have a real beauty and 1970s glamour to them. And it almost feels like it's captured in this look specifically. I also think it's important to note the Louis Vuitton airplane bag. I don't know how utilitarian it is, but I do know collectors will clamor to have it, which again, 
that's kind of the whole point of Louis Vuitton. Earlier we talked about granite motifs, but marble motifs in fur coats and suits also arrived and were beautiful. The modern world sees marble as one of the more luxe ways to decorate homes, so why not clothing too? Also, it bounces off of the set design as well. A Louis Vuitton monogrammed kente cloth emerges and many took issue with it. I've read that according to Ghana Coffin, a website about Ghana's culture and crafts, that the kente cloth is not meant to be worn as an everyday style, but is reserved for specific occasions. Each of the colors have meaning and tell the story of Ghana. Elvis Wallace Bruce, a tour guide in Ghana, explains some of the colors' meanings in The International Traveler. The red represents the blood we shed in our struggle for independence, the gold represents the wealth from our industrial minerals, the green represents the rainforests and grasslands, and the five-pointed black star is the symbol of our people and African emancipation. As for my opinion on the look, gonna mind my white, business. Thank you so much. The full plaid suit that has a green scarf draped over it is actually quite fun and enjoyable, and to me pulls from the great kilt of Scotland, which draped fabric over the shoulder. But fabrics like the kente cloth are also draped in this manner, so I'm not too sure where the influence really lies. Another kente cloth is draped over a white suit, and this one has a very interesting tie-in as well. Ghanaian folklore tells of two friends that saw a spider weaving a web and wanted to give the same thing a try. They returned to their village of Bon Wire, which is still the most famous place to make the kente cloth, and made the earliest kente out of black and white fibers from a raffia tree. I wonder if Virgil was trying to touch upon this early aspect of the textile? The collection ends with not too many more exciting looks, but overall I think it was one of Virgil's strongest collections yet. His work over the past few seasons has channeled the camp of Louis Vuitton. It makes products that are desirable and smartly inserts signatures of the brand in ways that are growing more and more cunning. And for that, good job, Virgil. I'm happy about it. See, different clothes. Let's get into Rick Owens. So Rick Owens this season felt like a bit of an anomaly. The past few men's collections have felt so powerful, strong, and it was easily seen how they lead the women's wear collections that trailed behind. But this season felt discombobulated. And while I am usually one to drag a brand for that, with Rick, an odd collection every once in a while is something I can try and work my way through. Listen, if you have a good track record, I can't get too upset. The show started off with the model wearing a gigantic bomber coat that fell to the floor. The sole garment the model wore besides it was a pair of white underwear with an inverted pentagram over the bulge. Of course. The inverted pentagram is commonly associated with satanic worship, but really has history with circles of Wicca, the religion. While some may find it demonic, which I mean like Mm. The inverted pentagram actually references the male gods of Pan and Suranos. In that context, it's the right way to start off a men's collection if you think about it. It's also not lost on me that the black furry thigh-high boots are on the model. Maybe a reference to the furry goat-like legs of these gods of old? Possibly. Next, a black leather boiler suit is paired with Rick's newest collaboration, Square Toe Converse. Rick has been inspired by Converse since his fascination with the Ramones came about. He even mentioned that many of his shoe references came from Converse, which would make sense when you look at the famed black and white geobaskets. I wouldn't say the shoes are revolutionary, but the fact that you can see the rounded white tip of the classic Converse, which is then devoured by a square toe, which Owens has explored in shoes for the past couple of seasons, it is true to both brands, and so I can't knock it. But unfortunately, not even Rick Owens can sell me on the American classics. Then an elongated sweater with what looks like arm and head holes displaced throughout is paired with a shirt, leather pants, and floor length coat. I have a feeling the coat is meant to be some sort of take on the idea of comfort and the clothing we gravitate towards during the pandemic, but that doesn't make it look more flattering. A round two of oversized coat, pentagram tidy whities and knee high fur boots just with green fur arrives and I have never wanted to look like Mr. Tumnus more in my life. The boiler suit from earlier gets two different stylings, one half on, the other in full BDSM regalia, and both are paired with shearling coats. A hooded leather jacket also has attached gloves and zipper slits, which might be helpful considering our current global standing. It was paired with a pair of pentagram shorts and underwear and a pair of thigh high 
high boots, which might be a new take on the leggings and shorts trend that took over menswear in the mid 2010s. More sheer length styles arrive, none particularly interesting, but one did showcase that the gloves on the coats do have the tips of the fingers removed, probably for phone using purposes. Two bomber jackets have tight ribbing at the bottom, which creates an almost jacked silhouette. The sleeves also seem to have pockets, which is an interesting and utilitarian aspect to the pieces. And I feel like the jacked part is probably because Rick goes to the gym a lot. This is the second time we've seen more real world applications to Rick's garments this show. And I wonder if this is something the brand is trying to implement more and more for customers. A slew of puffer jackets comes in purple and green and seem like they are deconstructed. The shoulders are exposed. The cuffs feel like they have extra fabric and one looks like it only has half of a collar. To be honest, there's some of the most interesting pieces in the collection, but the functionality of them seems lacking. And while there has been some avant-garde styles, Rick has also made pieces that feel more more commercial, which most brands now have tended to do. Two beautifully cut and slim coats arrive in leather and pony hair. They are piped with zippers that go all the way around the collar and feel like Rick's version of commercial, which I can stand by. There is a bit of a less commercial version of the aforementioned coats in black and white made of some sort of yarn or Sherpa that's paired with green leather pants and a displaced whole sweater dress. I wanna say it's a dress, but at this point it could just be a sweater cause Rick does love a long top. A coat is sleeveless and continues on that deconstruction vibe, but it's actually rather interesting coming from Rick. Something about it reminds me of something he would actually wear to showcase his muscles though. Another coat arrives as well as a white Sherpa style hooded sweater with gloves, which then pours into a jacket that is quite peculiar. I can't tell if the coat is printed on or deconstructed, which is half the fun, but I wonder if Rick looked to deconstruction considering there has almost been a deconstruction of everything we knew due to the pandemic. Padded puffer coats emerge, one in black that is particularly lovely and a green version that is more suited for conservative customers. A question I should probably ask myself though, does Rick Owens have conservative customers? A bolero jacket version of one of the coats we saw earlier was paired with a black shirt that exposed the torso and a pair of baggy pants that were so big, I thought they were gonna fall down as the model walked. I don't think it's a bad thing though, as it feels like a take on how most people have thrived in sweatpants and oversized pieces during lockdown. A white Sherpa and green fur jacket was lovely. A black bomber was sutured to another coat underneath, playing into reconstruction rather than deconstruction. And a full green fur coat was overall just stunning. The collection ended with an oil slick of black coats that were either deconstructed or reconstructed and paired with many different versions of already seen pieces. To be honest, this was not some mesmerizing, miraculous, or even memorable Rick Owens collection. There were definitely memorable pieces and some that I'm still drooling over, but I think that it's one of the weaker Rick collections. But during a pandemic where an independent business is trying to keep themselves afloat, I'm not here to drag them. I have some common decency. Can I be disappointed? Absolutely, but I doubt next season these same feelings will persist. Next, let's talk about Botter. Rushimi Botter and Lisi Herbra don't get the love they deserve. They don't get it at Botter nor Nina Ricci where they are the brand's creative directors either. The collection is called Romancing the Coral Reef, which was seen on the brand's opening look in a t-shirt. The brilliance of this first look is the deconstruction of the classic blazer by removing the lapels, which could be a way to entice those looking for a more casual suit look. A blue shirt at the collar laces up and it has a center tab that almost looks like the tongue of a shoe, which does feel like a trend that is recently starting to bubble up. Paulina Russo has upcycled sneakers and turned them into corsets and dresses and even has an Adidas line for those interested. And Ankuda Sarda has taken Nike sneakers and upcycled them into heels as well. So this trend of snormans, AKA sneaker garments as I'm calling them, has already taken form. Here, I don't think Botter knocks it off. I think designers do riff off of each other and I think the diet Prada-ification has almost made that illegal, but I don't think it's always a bad thing. Botters is more commercial, focused at the collar and is menswear. And as long as Russo specifically is cited as the originator of these styles, I don't think it's such a bad thing for this to have been explored by others. Had v &A not invented the bias cut, where would many designers be? Or Stephen Burroughs with the lettuce hem. Fashion is about reference. And as long as the reference is cited properly and not plagiarized, although it doesn't have to be an MLA format, why shouldn't we allow those explorations? A plaid vest is then paired with a low slung pair of trousers with white boxer shorts visible. And fashion consultant Baby Gregory spoke about it saying, quote, black boys 
sagging, their pants has always been controversial and labeled as dangerous. It has even been criminalized. Botter embraces our cultural nuances, and by placing boxers above tailored trousers, makes a powerful statement on black respectability. The look is recreated with more minimal colors in black and white as well. A stellar take on the suit arrives in a light yellow, but the jacket is more like a tunic rather than blazer. It has a deep plunging neckline that I presume must be put over the head, rather than put on like a normal jacket, which might entice customers looking for a more casual process of dressing. It also takes away from the contrived menswear notions of only buttoning one button on your suit jacket. Which listen, I love a deconstruction of contrived notions. I do. A bright blue turtleneck underneath even furthers the casualness of style. We see another shoe tongue collar shirt in a light yellow, as well as another cutout lapel suit jacket. It's smart for young brands to constantly shove their signatures in audiences' faces. It makes the styles memorable, not just for seasons to come, as well as when customers are leafing through racks or website pages that are selling Botter products. Listen, we're in a pandemic. An oversized striped polo shirt with brown stripes that are frayed at certain parts is interesting, but that brown wool utility jacket and pant is far better. A white quilted set is full of florals and cross motifs, and that just personally gives the small gay in me who had to go to church every Sunday anxiety, so we're just gonna skip her. We're just, we're moving on. The remixing of traditional menswear notions continues when a brown wool parka-like coat has its shoulders slit that allow the arms to expose themselves, not through the sleeves, rather over them. A bag that looks like a buoy is a sort of signature trope of their work. Not necessarily this specific bag, but rather nods to the ocean and water water-specific items placed throughout their collections. The duo both have ties to the Caribbean, and so little nods to their water-filled world like these buoy bags is sweet, and a brilliant jumping off point for the brand to get into accessories. I also would like a buoy bag. Less traditional takes on the suit continue with a black suit that has plunging cuts that expose a pink and purple graphic turtleneck underneath. I must say, I love seeing styles like this. Suiting is kind of dead, except for those who have to wear suits for work, formal functions, and well, that's about it. I'm not saying I think suits should be the only things in vogue, but I do think that finding a suit that actually feels interesting and shows a bit of personality would help those who tend to stay as far away from men's warehouse as possible when it comes to formal events. Me. I am that person. It allows customers to actually have something interesting to say with their outfit, and isn't that what fashion is about? A monochromatic pink suit and turtleneck follows and is nice enough, while a suit jacket is again deconstructed and becomes a halter top, which makes me laugh at the very least. I feel like that's great fashion. If I'm laughing, we're having a good time. It's a good collection, I'm sure. More nautical themes come in with a suit covered in fishing tackles. I don't know how many will be clamoring to buy it, but it's a fun piece that ties into the brand's history and aesthetic, and and that I can appreciate. A blue suit is clean and classic and a more commercial style for less adventurous Botter customers, while a buoy covered top follows and brings a ridiculous yet bottery feeling to the collection. An umbrella-like hood is filled with pinks and oranges, blues, and reds, and again, is not very wearable, but it's very funny, and so claps for that. I must say, throughout the pandemic, very few brands have seemed to have fun in their collections. And while some are acting like everything is normal, and others are taking their work more seriously, seeing a brand like Botter bring joy and creativity into their pieces is that little dose of serotonin I need. A blue coated fabric is placed over a suit jacket, and while it's commendable to try and reinvent the raincoat, I think this needs to be way more refined. Another new take on the raincoat has panels and supports that are reminiscent of the partitions of an umbrella and create an exaggerated A-line shape. This is my favorite take on the style yet, although again, unwearable unless you're really that kind of girl, which in that case, go off. A simple black suit has blue side panels, which brings an element of color to an otherwise simple yet nicely cut suit, and a key lime green oversized shirt and pant combo feels a little bit out of place in the collection. It's not bad, but it seems to be a little bit left field from everything else we have seen thus far. The finale look is a blue and white graphic turtleneck and a pair of black pants that look as if they've been folded down, which feels a little bit like a scuba suit in the midst of being taken off or put on. It's missing the sleeves and the top of the torso though, bringing back for a big finale the idea of deconstruction. In reality, it's a great finale look to tie together the idea of the romancing the coral reef with these aquatic elements, which are being reinterpreted into everyday wear and in a strange way bringing a more suave menswear style to these usually water-only textiles and objects. Most of the pieces in this collection are wearable, have new interpretations of menswear, and are actually 
desirable. Bonner is a brand that, in my opinion, gets undervalued by the large fashion landscape, but this collection proves that that's a very dumb notion to have. Next, let's talk about Arturo Obejero. Normally, when I hear that a designer's collection was made in two weeks, I am not enthused. But when I hear that Arturo Obejero's collection was created in two weeks by him and him alone, I was instantly intrigued. And my intrigue was definitely rewarded in his Puro Teatro collection. The Spanish designer went to Central St. Martin's and has consistently focused on craft rather than the performative aspects of the fashion industry. Puro Teatro references his inspiration of dance his want to be creative in the face of a pandemic, and the fact that the collection is crafted from upcycled velvet theater curtains. The first look is a great example of this upcycling, with a bright burgundy moiré top reminding us of the curtains at any theatrical production. Arturo's desire to speak to the constraints of life in Paris during the pandemic materializes in these large cuffs, which are a brand signature. With bows at the back that almost paralyze the ease of movement a hand would normally have. Another large bow is decorating the back and also exposes it, while the now mandatory mask morphs into a collar that covers the model's mouth. An icy blue tailored pant and loose shirt will put Obejero customers at ease as his signature commercial pieces are back, but with a velvety feel. His high-waisted pants definitely reference traditional matador styles and have been around since at least his Palmyra collection. The baggy shirt has also been an early invention and has been played on season after season, making it a signature. A red top again takes on that curtanic feel, but seems to be a take on the ruffles that Obejero has played around with time and time again. Again. Its shape almost forces you to look at and focus on the bust, which I think is an uncommon occurrence during a menswear collection. And note the length of the collar, not totally suffocating, but not subtle either. A dark blue strapless jumpsuit reimagines another Obejero classic. The exaggeration of the height of the matador trousers becomes a full-fledged garment that encapsulates the torso, while the belt loops and belt do reference the fact that they were initially pants. The glove hood scarf is odd but at the same time is a fantastical take on masks and the world we currently live in. A red version of the classic Obejero look comes, and considering Arturo has started selling his pieces through his e-commerce site, continuing to touch on styles that he knows work seem like a smart business decision. While the collection is about creativity and crafts, I think very few young designers aren't thinking about how the pandemic is affecting business. A pair of black high-waisted pants are paired with a ruffle top that exposes the bust. Again, note the focus on the bust. Paired with a classic white button-down shirt, the look could add a bit of camp to an outfit, but it feels like more of a showpiece rather than actual wear. The finale look is a red strapless jumpsuit, and when a backless top is added, it gives the look the daring silhouette I think Arturo channels quite well. I hate to be a cliche, but when I see Arturo's work, I do think of Cristobal Balenciaga, or Balenciaga, as Arturo likes to say. While chatting, even Arturo noticed some similarities between their upbringing in the north of Spain, and while I think Arturo shapes are much more linear, I think they still are very daring, especially for menswear. And I mean, listen, Mr. Balenciaga was very, very daring when it came to shape. Overall, there's a lot of heart in this collection, a lot of craft in this collection, and a lot of looking to the future of our planet in this collection, and a lot of staples in this collection too. Arturo is building a brand, and he's doing it in the way that many small fashion businesses are doing it, and I think he's on the right track. To finish out the video, let's talk about Dior Men. Kim Jones' Dior early on was something I really admired. His artistic collaborations were exciting and fun, but as time has gone on, I've come to realize they are truly a crutch that he, and Dior relies on to make commercial product, not to celebrate the artists. This season, like just about every other season at Dior Men, was a collaboration with, you guessed it, an artist. This time, Peter Doig. Doig? I don't know. The painter is world renowned for his autobiographical pieces that depict his life in Trinidad and his infusion of historical art techniques. The collection starts with a black suit with white piping in an obviously military inspired style, which was based on the ceremonial attire of the Académie de Bois my French, we're working on it. The gold embroidered coat does resemble the embroidered piping on those tailcoats, although here, while I revered the artisans working on it, feels like a snoozy attempt at doing it. As I've said before about Chanel, if you're gonna make artisans put hours of effort and work into pieces, make it worth their time. The next look confronts the archaic trope about not wearing black and navy blue together while piping the look in white. I wonder about the choice of rubber boots though. 
Kim's accessories sell like hotcakes, that is undeniable. But will these two get customers hot and heavy? A brown sweater covers a gold and black button down while the first saddlebag of the collection arrives, a style that he has shown time and time again. While repetition has worked for him at brands like Louis Vuitton, cause that monogram very rarely goes out of style, the same cannot yet be said for Dior. Listen, how long will these people rely on the crutch of John Galliano's creativity? I want to know. The pants here are of interest though, as they look to hit the knee and stop while a longer pair sprouts out underneath and finishes the job. Next is a burgundy wool coat, which has a purple silk jacket underneath, which is piped in a firm gold. This is what we like to see. Dior's obsession with camo is a cam no. Although this boiler suit style turned into a functioning two piece suit did make me do a double take. An orange sweater has a yellow motif running through it, which is no doubt a reference to Peter Doig, Kim's collaborator for this season. The paint strokes do resemble the way clothing is shown in Doig's work, and the hat the model wears resembles Doig's chopped hand piece from 2017. A slew of yellow looks come through touching on the military aesthetic, which is evident in most of the coats. While I'm sure they're nice clothing and beautifully made, there is nothing exciting or stand out about them. A yellow sweater full of red, green, black, and white spots is actually a smart play on another painting called Two Trees by Doig, where one of the subjects wears the exact same sweater, or at least it's painted like he's wearing the sweater, I think. Since Doig's work does actually depict real people, Kim's use of Doig's interpretations of others' wardrobes is smart. A pink sweater depicts what looks like a lion, maybe another reference to Chopped Hand, and if graphic sweaters sell well for Dior men, I'm not opposed. A printed coat then appears and looks like a Doig painting, but this is my issue with Kim Jones as Dior men in general. While it's nice to collaborate with an artist, that does not mean that you as the designer should stop pushing and trying and reworking your voice, as well as the voice of your collaborator. Kim, to me, has found his routine at Dior Men. Work with an artist, put their prints on the clothing, and then do some nice tailoring. And that's just about it. And after a while, that becomes really stale, like white bread. And fashion is not about the stale or routine or sameness. This is when I think it becomes evident Kim's work is, I'm gonna say it, lazy. Throwing a print on a coat and calling it a look is not exciting. And I won't sit here like the rest of the fashion choir and sing about how it is. It's also not that exciting of a coat with side slits that exposes the lining and like, why couldn't the lining have been printed on? if we knew it was going to be constantly visible. While most of Kim's Dior work is clean, this is obviously sloppy. An ombre coat is lovely, but not exciting. A periwinkle suit has military braided descending down the front, which gives a trompe l'oeil effect of ceremonial sashes. And the sleeves also have details that remind you of military medals. This is the kind of Kim Jones work I like to see. And like a Dior monogram roller coaster, we keep clicking up, up up as a white button down shirt is sheer everywhere except the stomach, bringing a more daring feel to the collection. The front has paint strokes that are opaque and have a more abstract feel than the usual commercial garments that we see, and it's brilliant. The way the shirt is lined in little white motifs that look like tiny white paint strokes was that subtle touch that makes me swallow my previous words about Kim Jones' staleness. Some more military inspired looks emerge that are similar to the ones from earlier, just in different colors. Another sweater in yellow and green feels like the most mohair out of all the knits we've seen, although they've all been pretty mohairy. A black coat with a white, almost stained motif arrives. It's subtle, but not particularly eye-catching. Printed coats, jackets, and shirts all arrive, but aren't terribly dynamic either. And the collection finishes out with a periwinkle blue fur coat with military shirt and pant underneath. Not the kind of grand finale many would expect. Although, Kim Jones, does like to do a little bit of a nod to the brand that he's going to, so I think that fur coat is probably a nod to the fact that he was about to do his Fendi collection. As I've already said, Dior Men is a brand that I early on saw so much promise in, but as artist collaboration after artist collaboration has come, it's taken the wind out of Kim Jones' sails. I don't think the great aspects of this collection eclipse the not so great aspects, unfortunately. So that is the end of our Men's Fashion Week review. I'm sorry it's really late, but listen, I already made the review, so I just had to get her done. So now she's done. Please let me know what collections you guys thought were the best. I would love to hear it. I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for watching and TTYL.